from Illinois Public Media, this is The 21st Show. I'm Brian Mackey. The Internet has dramatically changed our lives and our society. There's an entire world of information, misinformation, and entertainment at our fingertips. But for many of us, this is a world we grew into. The water was warmed gradually, and we've learned to adapt to it. But for many young people today, they've never known a world that is not online all the time. They've grown up watching TikToks, following famous YouTubers, and keeping up Snapchat streaks with one another. But with great power comes great responsibility. So how do parents handle this changing world and help their kids navigate through it? All this is the subject of the new book, Growing Up in Public, Coming of Age in a Digital World, by Devorah Heitner. Heitner introduces her book by quoting Bryce Dallas Howard, the actor and director and daughter of Ron Howard. Given all that, she knows more than a little about living her life in public, and she shared some of her hard-won wisdom at a TED Talk last year. There's pressure to share more of ourselves than we want. We often feel we have no other choice to be relevant, to fit in, to get ahead, to be trusted and liked, accepted and understood. This new compulsion toward self-exposure is possibly the biggest social experiment in history. We're making life-altering decisions about our personal boundaries with no guidance and no precedent. Fortunately, there is a blueprint. Anyone who's lived in the public eye as an athlete, a politician, or an entertainer has navigated a version of this. Before I share, I ask myself, why? What's the purpose? And most importantly, how does it serve the people I love? Heitner writes that, rather than trying to micromanage our kids' online lives, parents should shift their focus from consequences to building character, helping their kids figure out who they really are and teaching them to respect their own privacy and reputation by modeling that respect for them. Heitner lives in Chicagoland and has a Ph.D. from Northwestern in Media, Technology, and Society. She was previously a professor at Lake Forest College, and one of her earlier books was ScreenWise, Helping Kids Thrive and Survive in Their Digital World. I originally spoke with Heitner in October. Because of that, we're not taking calls live today, but you can let us know what you think anytime by emailing talk at 21stshow.org, talk at 21stshow.org. Devorah Heitner, welcome to the 21st show. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. All right. So uh, you be, you write that kids are growing up immersed in digital communities. And I thought maybe for those of us who do not uh, have teenagers yet, in my case, or, or some listeners who maybe haven't had a teenager in their house in a while, take us through what a typical teenager's digital day would look like, right? Say maybe a, a 15-year-old high school sophomore from the moment they wake up. Okay, so they're going to have some messages potentially from their school-based apps with updates on assignments and grades. They may be in one or two smaller group texts. If they're younger, they may be in more, but a 15-year-old might be in just like one or two small group texts with close friends or someone they're on a team with. They're also going to have updates from any social apps they're on. So say they're on Snapchat, they may have some updates when they wake up. And then If they're on apps like Discord that a lot of gamers use, they may have updates from there too. So there's like a lot of information pouring into the brain as they're, you know, getting up and starting their day, walking to school, getting on the bus, et cetera. And then they get to school. And oftentimes a lot of school is now uh, has app based uh, environments and, and social elements built into the learning. Absolutely. Almost every high school student has some kind of app for school where they're at least getting their grades and their assignments and Sometimes there's also portals where there's class discussion going on in these apps. So it can really add to the sort of mental load. Yeah, it adds to the mental load. And then, of course, all these things come back into play after school, right? Maybe they have another app for teams or clubs. Uh, They're thinking about homework. They're back on with their friends, being on Discord if they're a gamer or Snapchat for almost everyone. Mm -hmm. So they're fully immersed. We've established that. What are some of the concerns you hear from parents about what their kids are doing online? So parents worry about their kids changing their personalities, trying to appear a certain way, which, you know, part of being a teenager is figuring out who you are, figuring out your identity. And 
you're already playing different roles with your family versus with your friends or even with different groups of friends. You might be slightly different versions of yourself. And to some degree, that's, you know, developmentally expected. We want our kids to behave differently in different environments, right? But we worry about, a lot of parents worry about kids who seem to be sort of selling their soul to the gram or whatever, you know, they're trying to be a certain way to get likes and followers on whether it's Instagram or Snapchat, YouTube, TikTok. And it's, it can feel like a lot of pressure. And there's a concern that it doesn't give kids enough space to just kind of figure out who they are and maybe make some mistakes along the way. Make some mistakes along the way. And they worry about the consequences of those mistakes too, right? If, if, so, if a kid does something, it's going to be out there forever. Absolutely. And I think we need to change that messaging a little bit and talk about how all of us have made mistakes in our lives and how we repair and move forward, as opposed to teaching kids that mistakes are irrevocable and devastating and they can never move forward. I think that's a message kind of from the early days of the internet that we need to be revising and thinking about like everyone has at least forgotten a BCC or texted the wrong person or the wrong thing, right? It can be a minor issue, but all of us are going to make some mistakes with our online sharing. We're going to share news that turns out not to have been public yet, or we're going to post a picture of someone that we thought was okay with them to share. And it turns out they are not okay with it. We need to apologize and take it down. So these are kind of everyday occurrences and we need to talk with our kids about how we're resolving some of our own, you know, minor to major mistakes online so that they can recognize that there is repair possible and that they don't want to go screenshot something someone says, for example, and share it out of context. They don't want to be part of amplifying someone else's errors or causing damage to that person's reputation because we all want to live in a world where we have some benefit of the doubt. We're not out there trying to catch each other making mistakes and amplifying them. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people do want to be out there catching other people making mistakes and amplifying them. Maybe not a lot, but there's certainly that. But it could be your kid next time. That's no, the thing. It's like if you think yeah. you're going to throw some somebody's teenager under the bus and amplify with a bunch of outrage, something they've shared, just be careful what you're doing. I mean, I think we all want to actually really think about if we want to live in that world. And um, any one of us could have a text or a post taken out of context, and it could sound pretty bad, I think. And so we have to be very cautious about getting into a gotcha culture. Yeah, that's definitely happened to me. Um, all right, you do you do workshops for parents, you do different workshops for students. What are some of the misconceptions you hear from parents about how their kids use and and really think about social media and being online? A lot of parents worry that if their kids, for example, maintain two accounts, a lot of kids I interviewed for growing up in public maintain on Instagram, for example, sort of a main account, which is like your directory listing where anyone could find you and that might be more public. And then maybe a spam account that you use just with your four or five besties to share things in a closer circle that you might not share more widely. And Parents sometimes worry that that means their kid is up to something no good. But generally, that just means a kid is managing their privacy. And you are going to speak differently to your four or five or three you know, close friends than you would to in a public account that anyone could search up and find you. So I think parents need to recognize that kids are actually managing their privacy in some ways. In the book, I do clarify that kids are more focused often on their small privacy, like not having someone outside of their social circle see something or feeling like mm. it's a little invasive when, you know, Uncle Ned comments on your on your Instagram <laughs> when you kind of forgot Uncle Ned was even there. And they forget sometimes about big privacy, like algorithmic privacy, facial recognition, et cetera. They also can't stand it when their parents post without permission about them. And that's something we all need to be thinking about if we have kids in our lives is we shouldn't be posting about them without their consent. Yeah, you have a whole chapter on that. I'm going to come back to that. But, you know, this idea of privacy, that's interesting that they think, you know, they don't want Joey in the trumpet section finding out what they're saying about them, whereas the parents are thinking about, I don't want the university admissions committee to find out what Exactly. Is and a yeah. lot of what we talk about when we specifically talk about college, which I know a lot of kids are working on their early application deadlines right now, it's coming right up for many seniors and they don't need to worry in the way we think they do. And it's a problematic message. The reason we don't wanna tell kids don't post that because you won't get into University of Illinois or you won't get into Stanford is because 
we're giving kids the wrong message. First of all, we're telling them don't get caught. What we want to say actually is don't do harm. Don't amplify anything harmful. Don't do anything on the internet that you're not proud of. Don't be part of causing harm to other people, individuals or a group, rather than saying, if you post that, you won't get that scholarship or you won't get into the fancy college. We really want to emphasize don't do harm. And the, the second reason is most people don't get caught, right? Very few kids actually sort of get caught for what they post, because although we live in a little bit of a gotcha culture, thankfully, most of us are not gotcha. And that isn't the reason not to do it. And it's also not true. And frankly, when you say it to a middle schooler, it's especially not true. A lot of people will say to a seventh grader, you know, if you put that on the group text, you won't get into Yale. Well, that's not true. I worked in it at Northwestern when I was a grad student, just reading admissions essays, but I know they were not trying to find out kids' Instagram handles and do a deep dive into their posts. They had, you know, just, you know, maybe 10 minutes with each application that met the more basic requirements. They're not doing a, an NSA level search on your kid. And so it's important not to give kids lies, incorrect information about what admissions is doing. And it's also important to not emphasize the consequence, the external judgment of an admissions officer, when ultimately it's between you and you, what you post, and you don't want to have to live with having caused harm or amplify something negative or cruel. That's right. Yeah. I, I still, it burns sometimes. I think of like you know, inconsiderate things that I've said. I suppose today it might even be considered a microaggression, just sort of thoughtlessly in my life. And I'm just so glad that, you know, it wasn't amplified out there. You know, probably even if it was, nobody would have fought, caught it. But, um, you know, this is, um, you hit on a point there about this idea of teaching kids not to do harm versus teaching them to fear consequences. And this is one of the main ideas of your book, right? Teaching kids the right way to do this, building their character so that they make the right choices. This is a broader parenting lesson. Absolutely. And this is an ongoing conversation that we're not just sort of presenting our best selves in public and then secretly going online and anonymously doing bad things. We want everything we do online and in person to be aligned with how we see ourselves as a human being, what kind of friend we are, what kind of community member we are. Yeah. And I guess it goes to that idea. Don't do something in, uh, you know, the, the, in private that you wouldn't want everybody to know about in public. Um, and there is no anonymity. Yeah. I mean, we go to yeah. an these anonymous places on the Internet sometimes or people will make anonymous comments on an article or a YouTube channel, but there's nothing that's really anonymous. So it's good to remember that. Yeah. How has the perception of privacy changed among young people today compared with baby boomers or Gen Xers like myself, I think like you as well, or even millennials who were kids, right? They they had an expectation of privacy that is somewhat lacking today. And some of that is because of people in our generation and what we shared about our young people when they were young. Absolutely. Kids are growing up more scrutinized, more surveilled between school apps that know their location. Like my kids swiping into the cafeteria at lunch every day in high school and I was able to skip lunch every day and eat with my friends in the theater and drama club. You know, there was no location app on my school ID. So I think there's just a tremendous amount of surveilling kids. Parents are surveilling kids on Life 360, especially when they start driving. And so geolocation, apps that allow parents in some cases to read their children's texts, this is incredibly invasive. So just because the technology, you know, lets us surveil our kids, it doesn't mean that we should. And the same thing with posting about them, and it's not just us. Again, school posts about them, activities they do might post. So our kids often have a digital footprint before they themselves are even posting about themselves. You know, if kids join social media at 12, 13, 14 years old and start posting, that's not the beginning of their digital footprint the way they might imagine. There's often quite a bit of record of them since they were born. Yeah, I mean, as somebody, I'll just say, as somebody who's a journalist, I've been on Twitter and, and Facebook. I'm not as active as I used to be, but uh, since I think about 2008 or so, and to my knowledge, my kids' names or, or likenesses have never been put there by me. But I've certainly seen a lot of things that other parents post, funny stories, right? They're, they're, they're well-meaning, I think. Maybe they're looking to commiserate with other parents about the tribulations of parenthood. I remember one story about a you know, on second thought, I don't think I'm actually going to share that. I don't want to call anyone out in particular, but things that I thought, even at the time, like, oh my gosh, in 10 years, this kid is going to read this and be mortified that this story is out there now, but this is pretty common. 
Well, I think parents, when they do share about their kids, are looking for community or frankly recognition for the hard labor of parenting. You know, when you post that slightly boastful post about your kid and their ice hockey win, you're also kind of sharing like, hey, guess who drives that kid at 5 a.m. every day to the rink? You know, <laughs> it's 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 a it's a family affair. But I, I think especially when we're looking for support for something our kid may be going through and all kids go through their struggles, it's really is exposing our kids in ways that we might not be thinking about and ways that, it, you know, kids feel like an extension of you, especially in those first years, you know, from zero to five. And we need to remember they're their own person and they will read this someday. And maybe I should go to my best friend or my sibling who's also raising kids or a therapist or, you know, walk and talk with somebody that I trust, but not share in a searchable way. We're not just my kids, the nightmare scenario is your kids, friends or peers yeah. find it and you and repurpose it and tease your kid about it. I mean, that's really, and I've spoken to a number of kids who had things, even things that their parents thought were yeah. pretty innocuous that they shared and it yeah. was not okay. And it, we're, it really, we're going to have to, we're going to have to take a break. We will continue this conversation in a moment. Stay with us. It's the 21st show. I'm Brian Mackey. We're listening to my conversation with Devorah Heitner. She has a PhD from Northwestern in Media, Technology, and Society. Her latest book is called Growing Up in Public, Coming of Age in a Digital World. It's a guide for parents to help children navigate this always-on, always-sharing, always-subject-to-scrutiny lifestyle that kids are living today. We asked members of our texting group about this struggle. A lot of you are going through versions of this. We got a message from David in Mount Morris who said, I personally think social media should be done away with altogether. It's just magnified all things negative in the world and has made it easier to exploit said negativity and negative responses to anything and everything involved with it. It creates what I like to call snap rage. People of all ages, including myself, are showing difficulty distinguishing between their real life and their online life. These lines have become blurred and quasi-indistinguishable. David goes on to say, I've gotten rid of most of my social media platforms, and I feel like my mental health and well-being have improved. Thank you for that message, David. As a reminder, our program's on tape today. We originally had this conversation back in October, but let us know what you think. The email for that is talk at 21stshow.org. Devorah, I wonder, and I'm sorry I had to jump sort of quickly to our break, lost a little track of the clock there, but I wonder how much David's idea, right, that social media in the way adults think of it as a place, or at least a lot of adults, is a place for political outrage. Is that affecting kids? Are young people doom scrolling? I think there is some outrage and kind of conflict, maybe less about political issues, although some kids for sure are being kind of recruited, unfortunately, into I think negative thoughts. I mean, part part of the problem is there is so much outrage. And when you're a teenager, there's like natural outrage and skepticism. That's just part of being a teenager. And like, what have the adults not been telling me? And what worries me is when kids go onto YouTube or Quora or Reddit and find other people who are like, hey, there's something you haven't been told. And then that thing you haven't been told is like adjacent to a hate group or a white supremacist oh, yeah. group or yeah. something like that. I mean, there, there's there's a way that teenagers are particularly vulnerable to misinformation and manipulated information because it's, it's again, developmentally expected as a teenager, you're going to feel like, oh, there's a little more to these stories in this world than I knew, or the adults haven't been telling me everything, or I'm so smart, I'm going to figure out the world myself. And in a way that's great. But if the first people who find you when you have that thought are hate groups, QAnon, yeah. um, and, and there's so much sort of edgy humor again on the internet, that's kind of adjacent to that. And that I think is a big vulnerability that we need to talk with our kids about in a very sensitive way. And one, I just saw someone sharing on another platform that, for example, she started a TikTok account and pretended to be a 14 year old boy and did nothing to indicate what she likes or didn't like, and immediately got started with feeds for misogynist content, right? So very troubling, right? To think that hateful content, content that's, you know, harmful to women or people of color. That's really 
very, you know, problematic in nature is being targeted toward our teens. So that's something we have to talk to kids about. I think kids themselves also will quit apps that feel bad sometimes. So I did meet a lot of kids who had quit TikTok in my interviews for growing up in public. And a lot of kids love TikTok. Don't, don't get me wrong. Most kids I talked to were like, I love this app. But a few were like, I loved it so much. I had to quit because I couldn't get anything else done or it really was hurting my sleep or my academic performance. So I did, I did hear from kids who had quit apps. And I, I think for the person who wrote in, sometimes taking a break from an app or getting off of an app can give you some needed perspective. True story. I had to set my own parental limits on my phone for myself with TikTok because I didn't like how much time it would just suck you in for. Uh, so set it to 15 minutes and eventually I just yeah stopped, stopped looking at it at all. You know, let's talk about, you mentioned this app a little while ago, Life360. I think that may be something that is very familiar to a lot of listeners and completely foreign to others. Can you just explain briefly what that is for people? Sure. It's an app that people can share their location on. And a lot of folks use it in their families to create sort of a circle of sharing locations. And to be transparent, I did meet families in my book research who, who like the app and are using it and their teenagers know it. I do think using it more covertly to, or, or forcing your teenager to kind of opt in, but saying like, you can't have a phone or use the car. If you don't quote unquote opt in, you're really using your power there. Like that's not really optional at that point. I think families should really think about how much surveillance do we want to do? Is this driving up difficulty or stress in our family, causing more conflict or mistrust than it, it it's saving us from? I interviewed one family where the mom was tracking her teenage son and found out the son who was 17 and was allowed to date. So this isn't a kid who's doing something that's not allowed by their family, but had a girlfriend. And she found out he was seeing someone because he kept, she kept seeing his data, his data point on the map at her house. And I thought, is this how you want to find out? Or do you want to wait until he's more sure about the relationship? And brings this young woman over and says, hi, mom, like, this is my girlfriend. Wouldn't you rather find out something like this about your child from them? And, and you worry about, you know, if, if she, then she, she did confront him and then he, he felt like he had to tell her, uh, but you wonder if he's ever going to share relationships with her in the future voluntarily. Yeah, this is something your book really made me rethink. I, I have long remembered this piece of advice I heard from, it was on a different podcast. It's actually a politics podcast, but sometimes they talk about family matters. They're very friendly. And it was a woman who said she, one of her regrets, and her, her children are college age or older now, but is when they first got their cell phones that she didn't say, this is my phone. I'm letting you use it. I get to look at your incoming texts and things like that. If, you know, on sort of a, a random testing basis, just, just to make sure that, you know, they weren't being groomed or, or something, something negative like that. And uh, it, it sounded like reasonable advice to me, but I, I suppose at some point you do need to build that zone of privacy for your kids. Talk about the, the struggle that parents have in deciding how much surveillance is appropriate. Do you start and then back it off? Do you never do any? How do you make that? How do you strike that proper balance? I believe we need to mentor more than monitor, but that monitoring can be part of mentoring if we do it with our kids. So say your 12 year old got a new phone for the first time, I would absolutely sit down with them and talk about who they're allowed to be in contact with, what apps are going to be okay, the, where the phone's going to live, and hopefully it's not going to be in their bedroom overnight. These are absolutely conversations we can have. What I don't want to see parents do is put an app on their kid's phone, get everything mirrored to them and believe, first of all, I've, I've, I've done my job here. I don't have to have difficult conversations with my child about conflict, about pornography, about all the things that can happen with a phone. And B, I don't want the parent sort of vis viscerally living through these texts and thinking they know everything that's going on with their kid without having that relationship. And see, I, I don't know what you do covertly. What do you do if you see something and you haven't told your kid you're monitoring? I mean, at least if that mom had told her kids, I'm monitoring, then that's a different thing because then she can actually let them know what she's seen. But there has to be a plan for backing off. It's one thing to sit down with your 12-year-old who's a new phone user and look with them maybe once or twice a week with them at the text they're getting and sending to see how it's going and then have a plan with them for backing off from that as you see they're texting appropriately. And maybe the plan also is that they're not even gonna get on social media for a while, right? They're not supposed to be on until they're 
13 at the minimum based on the apps, but you as a parent can decide when or if you're going to allow social media. And then as kids get older, you know, a 17 year old is very different than a 12 year old. You know, if your 17 year old is dating, do you even want to be reading those texts? I don't think you do, right? If your kid is in college and you're still paying their bill, do you want to be tracking their location and reading their texts? I really, really hope not. All right. Well, you raise an interesting point about teenagers getting into dating and you mentioned pornography before, but this is a big topic. It's a whole chapter in your book is this idea of sexting or nudes or selfies or just pics, as, as young people say. Um, this does inspire a lot of fear in parents, either about uh, irreparable reputational damage, scary news stories about, you know, young people charged with child pornography. Um, you have what you call an uncomfortable truth for parents. What is that? An uncomfortable truth is that sexting could be part of healthy sexual exploration. And I know it's illegal here in Illinois and in most states for minors to share pictures. I'm not ignoring that reality. I don't believe that consensual images exchanged, say, between like two 16-year-olds in love should be criminal, but that doesn't erase the fact that it is. I just want to acknowledge that I know that it's not allowed, a 16 and an 18-year-old is, is we, even more we need dangerous. to make yeah. sure that kids are safe and that they can talk with us. And if we, if we scare the heck out of our kids around sending nudes, the worry that I have is if they are in a non-consensual sharing situation where someone they thought they could trust has an image of them and is sharing that image around in a way that's abusive or threatening to do so, that they won't be able to come to us. So the uncomfortable truth is we have to talk to our kids about it and we have to not completely panic them so much to the point where if they were in a situation like the one I described, they couldn't talk to us and get help from us because in that situation, we would wanna be on their side. Just like if you would tell your kid, I don't want you to drink at the party, but if they do drink, you would still go pick them up rather than, you know, accepting that they're going to drive inebriated. I think it's important to say, of course, I don't want you to send nudes, but if you're in a situation where a nude is out there and it's you've lost control of, of where it's going, let's talk because I can help you. You still have legal and privacy rights in that situation. Yeah, I mean, this is really a version of saying that abstinence-only education doesn't work, right? And I and I remember when when I was a teenager, you know, fear of pregnancy was was real, and and you you know that was I remember thinking that's one of the worst things that could happen to people. From where I am now, though, a, a lifetime on the sex offender registry seems much much worse. How do you talk parents down from that? It's very important that we acknowledge what the risks are, and we also don't want to threaten kids with things like the sex offender list when that's not actually coming up. In other words, we don't want to say to a child who, you know, sent a picture to their sweetie, now you're going on the sex offender list, right? Sure. We can right. say there are risks, um, but we don't want to scare kids, especially with something lifelong that's incredibly damaging. And, and when that kind of threat is used inappropriately, it can have really serious consequences. So we, we need to focus on the safety of the child right now and find out, you know, was this consensual or not? If your child has been coerced, they also have legal rights in that situation. And in that case, there is a perpetrator who does need to face consequences. You know, if that perpetrator is another child, hopefully the consequences are different than if it was an adult, but that doesn't mean it's okay. And I'm not suggesting, you know, if, you, if a 15 year old is sharing pictures with people non-consensually, that that's something that there should be no consequences for. I don't want to see that person on, on an offender list or going to jail. Um, but I do wanna see that person have serious consequences and understand the gravity of what they've done and their social and privacy risks they've caused to another human being and the emotional harm they've caused to another human being. And in the chapter, in the book, I talk a lot about this in a, both a gendered way. And I try to also make sure that parents talk to their kids regardless of their gender identity, regardless of their sexual orientation. You know, queer kids are, are sexting, straight kids are sexting, kids who identify as non-binary are sexting. So we just need to have the conversation with all of our kids and especially not to reify these, these gender stereotypes where we're kind of slut shaming girls who send pictures and ignoring mm -hmm. boys' roles in all of this. I think it's very important that we talk to our sons as well about never coercing someone or begging someone to send an image or also not sending an unbidden image of their parts to people because that happens too. And uh, 
you know, in this case, I think you, you could threaten them about the registry, or you could just tell them that I interviewed a lot of girls for the book, and 100% of them said they would never date a boy who did that as a flirting technique. Yeah, That might be that was... more dissuasive to your son. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it's good. It, it might be helpful to actually just give them that information. Like, actually, girls just don't like that. Don't do it. Yeah. No, that was that was uh, surprising to me as somebody I haven't been on a, uh, 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 well, I was in high school in the early 90s. I'll just leave it at that. And say that me was, too. Different times. <laughs> yeah, very different times. Um, about three minutes until we need to take a break. What are some of the, so what I'm hearing from you is this is like safe sex, right? We we need to teach kids not not to do it, maybe. You teach them if they're going to do it, there are ways to do this safely. What are some of the advice you give about Absolutely. participating and, and in this I, aspect I, of- I yeah, cite my ahead. friends here, Samir Hinduja and Justin Patchen on safer sexting. Obviously there's no no completely safe way to send a nude, especially given all the risks we just talked about. But if you do send a nude, doing one without your face and without identifying characteristics is less risky. Some apps may be less risky than others. Uh, there may be also ways to send something that's sexy without actually being so revealing. And that's an interesting suggestion. Again, a hard one I would say to share with your children. Like how I, I mean, I get I get these conversations are tricky. And that's why I'd love to see schools, you know, get into some of these conversations more because I don't think anyone wants to talk to their parents about flirting and, you know, risque mm -hmm. pictures and all of that. But ideally, everyone in society who cares about kids needs to be having these conversations because, you know, 10 to 20% of kids, you know, have shared or would share. Um, the good news is 80% would not, but your kid's still going to hear about it. And so they also just need to know ethically, gosh, if somebody airdrops a picture to the whole cafeteria, my job is to erase it, not share it, right? Because it might not be your kid that's actually sending. And you, of course, hope it's not, but they may still be adjacent to something that goes around their community. And they need to know that they should never keep that on their phone because they don't want to be part of violating someone's privacy. I like that. That's say more about, I mean, briefly say more about that because that's important. The bystander effect, right? Right. Kids you don't want to be like role. if somebody's yeah. backpack got stolen, you'd give it back to them. You wouldn't keep hiding it from them. And so if somebody's picture is going around, something's been taken from that person that they didn't intend to cycle through a wide audience. And you should treat that person like someone who has rights and whose rights have been violated. Yeah. All right. We are talking with Devora Heitner. She is a PhD from Northwestern in uh, media, technology, and society. She was once a professor at Lake Forest College. She's the author of the book Screenwise, Helping Kids Thrive and Survive in Their Digital World. That was a number of years ago. Her most recent book out this year is called Growing Up in Public, Coming of Age in a Digital World. It's a guide for parents to help them uh, help their kids navigate through uh, this world where everything is online all the time. They can be exposed at a moment's notice and scrutinized and how to do that safely and thoughtfully and in a way that safeguards themselves and their friends. We're going to continue this conversation after a short break. This is the 21st show. Stay with us. This is The 21st Show. I'm Brian Mackey. We're talking with Dr. Devorah Heitner, author of Growing Up in Public, Coming of Age in a Digital World. And we're talking about helping young people navigate the always-on lifestyle we're living today. How do you deal with it when you can go viral at any moment, sometimes for unwelcome reasons? Our program is on tape today. You will hear references to some things that happened the week we originally had this conversation in October. That said, let us know what you think of the show anytime by emailing talk at 21stshow.org. So we talked a little bit before the break about um, sexting or nudes. 
what happens maybe if if uh, your kid shares a joke? You have an example in the book of a young woman who early in the pandemic shared a meme. She didn't maybe quite grasp the racist implications of it and didn't even realize for, I guess, weeks, if not a year, that that people really thought badly of her for what happened. And we live in this culture that's quick to deploy that scarlet letter, right? Be it an R for racist, an H for homophobic or whatever. How do these things happen? It's really easy for them to happen and it's really damaging. And what what can happen is, I mean, there, there's a range of examples that I share in the book. And that one is one where you really feel for all the kids involved. You know, she shared a xenophobic meme about COVID. She thought it was funny. She maybe didn't really understand how problematic it was. And people were very quick to think badly of her, but no one spoke to her about it directly. And because school was remote, she didn't really recognize what was going on because she wasn't seeing her peers and her classmates. So that kind of exacerbated how th- how things, you know, bad things were. And then someone finally did reach out to her and say, hey, did you know that people are really upset with you about this? And she took it down and apologized, but it really did affect her reputation going forward. And I think we need to talk with our kids both about not sharing things they don't understand. Like if you think that humor might be targeting a person or a group of people, definitely don't amplify it. Don't be part of it. Don't like it. I think we kids often will scroll and like things very quickly. And there's been a lot of cases where kids have gotten in trouble even for, you know, just hitting that thumbs up on something that maybe they didn't really consider deeply enough because that's like voting for it and affirming it, right? And saying you agree with it. Mm -hmm. I, I, think harder and harder about what I like on the internet based on the interviews I've done for growing up in public. But we also need to help our kids be a little bit less reactive and a little bit more direct with their peers. You know, if I see someone, like if someone I know posts something that I think could cause problems for them, maybe it's a teacher friend, you know, ranting about a parent and a bad day she had, I might reach out directly and text her and say, oh my goodness, did you know your settings are public? I don't want you to lose your job. I don't want you to get in trouble. You should take that down. What I wouldn't do is screenshot it and share it with the world because I think often people forget who the audience is when they're sharing things or they share things very quickly. And so we're all in this kind of reactive mode. Uh, I also wrote about the group of boys in, in Baraboo, Wisconsin, who are photographed making Nazi hand signs. And Someone in their community chose to tweet that out to the world and say, what's wrong with this community? And I wish instead they had gone to the people in the community and been like, hey, what are you, what's going on? What are you thinking? Rather than amplify it as a way of kind of trying to bring people to justice, you know, especially in situations like that where maybe it wasn't at that point known beyond the community. Obviously, if it's already happened, maybe that's too late, but you still don't want to be amplifying it. But in that case, there was such an opportunity for learning that was then lost because it got so big that the school was getting bomb threats. And then you go into defense mode. You know, once your school is getting bomb threats, it's hard to kind of look at yourself in the mirror and be like, wait, why did I think that was funny? How am I ignoring the realities of the Holocaust and, you know, harming my Jewish friends and neighbors by sharing this? What, what am I doing with myself? What, you know, I need to move forward and apologize and repair and learn a little more history. And what we instead see is these calls for, oh, like, don't let those kids go to college. And I'm like, no, no, as a college, you know, former college professor, I'm like, they need to go to college. Right. (laughs) They absolutely need to go to college because their high school history hasn't gotten them there. Yes. Send them to uh, Vassar or somewhere where they're really going to get a good liberal arts education. Um, You know, and you're right. Parents manage the crisis rather than addressing the bad behavior. What should parents do, though, when this happens? What are some of the steps they can take? In an ideal world, if your kid has, you know, at least two adults who are on their side, whether that's like, you know, a family where that's, you know, mom and dad or or two other parents um, or an, a family friend and one parent, somebody's got to deal with the sort of PR side of things while someone else deals with the mental health for your kid who in a really extreme public shaming situation, you know, may feel suicidal, right, may feel like they can never move forward and their life is over. Um, so that that kid needs support immediately and needs maybe someone to be with them kind of 24 seven, like maybe to also be looking at their phone with them and not be, you know, what if that kid is getting threats, right? That's a situation where, you know, mentoring over monitoring, again, doesn't mean just hand your smartphone over, hand the smartphone over and hope for the best. Like if my kid was, you know, heaven forbid, like getting death threats, I would be looking at their phone with them. I think it's very important to 
manage that and then have someone else out there sort of doing the PR. And then that person also who's kind of in, doing the internal stuff can help the kid figure out, are there apologies to be made? Where did I get these ideas? You know, it, w- w- what was I thinking? Um, and it's different, by the way, say you have a kid who has been recruited into some hatefulness, they're not going to go right to an apology. They may need to go to therapy. They may need to be deprogrammed. You know, um, I cite in my book, Christian Picciolini, who is also a Chicagoan and is a former white supremacist who's written several important books about recovering and moving forward from hate and is now an anti-hate activist um, doing very important work. And he talks about you can't start from just confronting and shaming someone because that pushes them to the edge. You know, that that might even isolate them further from the community, but listening to them with compassion and then ideally working with them to help them deprogram and move away from what they've been. But if you have a kid like the girl who was just being clueless, or I think most of these kids in Baraboo were not sort of confirmed, you know, white supremacists, some of them were just young and dumb, right? Then you work to help them understand how exactly how dumb they were. They should feel bad, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you help them move forward. Like, oh, maybe I do want to go to my my neighbor's house who's a rabbi and apologize for this and, you know, ask what I can read to learn to do better, right? And And make some kind of ways of of moving forward and making restitution in my community. And maybe I need to make a public apology, Um, but that's a process. You know, your kid's not going to be from like A to B in a day and they're not going to be, you know, volunteering um, in a community where they did harm immediately, nor would I want to subject that community to your kid if, if they did harm, they don't get it yet. And then we also need to, as a community, look at the targeted group. And I also interviewed a wonderful school principal who's written about anti-racist education, Henry Turner, for the book. And he talks about how often the targeted community won't even know, like say a kid gets suspended for a harmful post. Many times the people in the targeted community won't know that that happened because of school privacy laws. So as much as possible, we need to be transparent with the targeted community and think about what are we doing to make it safe for those kids? You know, in Baraboo, what are we doing to make it safe for kids of color and Jewish kids to go to school after seeing their classmates make the Nazi salute, right? What are we doing for you know, Asian American kids after the harmful post about COVID and with the xenophobic I- implications, right? I've talked to lots of kids who've been targeted by those posts who feel like their school did nothing. They focused on the perpetrator, maybe disciplining them, but they did nothing to make make it safe for, you know, the kids who were implied or targeted, and that's very important to do. You know, we've been talking through most of our conversation about the role that, that parents play in helping kids navigate this stuff. But there is another layer here, and that's the government potentially, right? You mentioned schools, I guess in the public schools at least, but also just this week, uh, attorneys general from 33 states, including here in Illinois, Attorney General Kwame Raoul uh, announced they're suing Meta, the company formerly known as Facebook. It also runs Instagram uh, on the basis that the business model of those companies target youth in ways that take advantage of them. And you had that line in near the beginning of our conversation, selling their soul to the gram. Um, where do you see government fitting into this framework? You know, we talk about when we talk about climate change, right? We say, you know, this is this cannot be solved individually. We really need uh, collective action in order to solve that problem. Where is the role of collective action in uh, making the online world a healthier place for young people to to live their lives? Well, I think these companies need to think very hard about their users. Like we are the product. We make your product work. Like Meta doesn't work if we don't use it. You know, if I get off Instagram and everyone gets off Instagram and gets off Facebook, Meta doesn't have a uh, good, you know, stock value. So they need to take care of their users and these lawsuits and these, these pressures from school districts, from states are a way to try to make these companies care more about the safety of their users, about toxic algorithms that send kids information about, you know, self-harm or eating disorders. And if they click on one thing, then they get flooded with that. So you have vulnerable kids being kind of flooded with very toxic algorithms. I, I think anyone who cares about kids understands why these lawsuits are happening. I don't necessarily know if the lawsuits are going to be the thing that works, But when you have these companies focusing on their bottom line and laying off content moderators or people people have impersonation accounts where someone's using their name and their likeness and no one responds to take that down and think about the damage to that person and their reputation if somebody's using that to bully them, 
that's a big deal. So I think these companies need to not hide behind the like, oh, it's just user problems. You know, we we can't control if people share information on our incredibly powerful platform that millions of people are using and, you know, having uh, and, and it's affecting their lives. I think, of course, people are trying to push back and states are trying to push back. I'll be interested to see what happens because right now we're seeing this painted as a wonderful across the aisle collaboration. And isn't it wonderful that this is a place where blue and red come together to care for children. And I'm curious what we'll see on the other side when we actually see legislation, because different political perspectives vary very much on what they think we need to protect children from. Mm. Everyone wants to keep kids safe. But what that means, whether we're talking about being safe from learning about sexuality or reproductive rights, or are we talking about being safe from being shot at school? There are really different perspectives about what we're keeping kids safe from. And that's what I worry about. Like, how will everyone come together on this legislation? Um, I do think that an important model is in the UK and they just passed a Children's Online Safety Act today, I believe. And that is a good model to look at. And in general, I would look at the UK and Europe as models of keeping kids safer on the internet. And we should be looking at some of those privacy rights and laws that our European friends are enjoying at this point. Yeah, yeah. Just about two minutes left in our time together. Last thing I wanna ask you about is if you see a fundamental change coming in the way our society views privacy, right? When we have the first Gen Z, or I guess what even comes next, Gen Alpha, uh, we'll see if that sticks. Members of Congress, and you know, it turns out they have some nude photos. Will this ever just not be a big deal? Because, well, so does everybody else, kind of thing. I do think the so does everybody else era has already begun, and also you see, you know, I mean, I when, remember when people were trying to, someone was trying to shame AOC for her awesome dance videos, which were like, <laughs> and then people were like, no, we love her even more. Right. So I think we'll see also some of that effect of like, yes, this is a human being and this person is like creative and fun. And, you know, so I, everyone will have a digital footprint. Your kid won't be the only one where there's, you know, a photo of them with boogers coming out of their nose, you know, when they go to run for president or something. But I do think that everyone is starting to wonder about sharing about, especially kids, given facial recognition, given some of the new technologies given AI and what the combination of AI and facial recognition where they can make these deep fakes of our children is it's truly terrifying. I think we're all in a moment where there may be a real backlash and, and a move towards, I just read somewhere, you know, our group text, the new social media. And I do wonder if people will move in that direction of sharing in very carefully chosen groups. Well, I am far from a young person, but that is basically where pretty much all of my sharing happens today is in a group text. So uh, it's a reality for some of us. Dr. Devorah Heitner is the author of Growing Up in Public. You can get it now wherever fine books are sold. Thank you so much for being with us today on The 21st Show. This was really informative. I appreciate your time. Thank you for the great questions. We'd love to hear what you think about what we've been talking about today or any topic in the recent past, whether you liked it or didn't like it. Maybe you think we got something factually wrong or, or right, for whatever reason. I've mentioned our email address throughout the program, but you can also leave a voicemail anytime, day or night, at 217-300-2121. That's 217-300-2121. You can find that number and our email address and every other way to contact us on our website, 21stshow.org. The 21st Show is produced by Christine Hatfield, Kennedy Vincent, and Jose Zapata. Technical direction and engineering comes from Jason Croft and Steve Mork. Reginald Hardwick is our news director. Thanks to the band Public Access for our theme music. The 21st Show is a production of Illinois Public Media. I'm Brian Mackey. Thanks for listening. We'll talk with you again tomorrow.